Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today's April 25th, 2014, and my guest is Gavin Andreessen, chief scientist of the Bitcoin Foundation. Gavin, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks. It's great to talk to you again. We first talked about Bitcoin. It was uh, seems like a very, very long time ago. It's been three years. A lot has changed since then, so I wanted to catch up. And let's start with a little review. How does a person get Bitcoins and what can you do with them when you have them? Sure. So to get Bitcoins, you need first a what's called a Bitcoin wallet. So you need a place to put them. And what that is, is just a piece of software that runs either on your computer, on your cell phone, uh, possibly on somebody else's computer or cell phone, that is a place where the Bitcoins can go. So your, the Bitcoin wallet software connects to the internet and runs the Bitcoin protocol, which talks to other people running Bitcoin wallets and the Bitcoin protocol. And then once you're connected to that network, you can participate in it. You can e- and receive Bitcoins from other people. You can send Bitcoins once you have them. Um, The way you get them typically is you trade things for them. Either you you trade a product or service and get payment in Bitcoin. Maybe you go to a currency exchange where you trade some dollars or euros or yen that you might happen to have. Um, Or maybe like me, you trade your labor. So I am actually paid my salary in Bitcoin and get paid to one of my Bitcoin wallets, my salary every month. Um, so that's that's the typical way people get Bitcoins. Uh, Bitcoin is different in that it's a decentralized system. So there is a second, much more difficult way to get Bitcoins, and that is to try to create them. So there's no central bank or Federal Reserve that issues Bitcoins. Instead, anybody can, again, run some software and connect to the Bitcoin payment network And then in exchange for doing the work of validating all of the Bitcoin transactions that are happening on the network, uh, you can get rewarded with some brand new Bitcoins. And that's the way all Bitcoins come into existence. There are strict rules on how many Bitcoins are issued over time. And lots of people all over the world are competing against each other to to try to, to get those Bitcoins. And every 10 minutes on average, um, somebody wins that competition and gets some brand new Bitcoins that they can then use to trade for products or services or you know, exchange for other currencies. And that limit, as we talked about in our last uh, episode, that that limit is what encourages people to be confident that there isn't going to be inflation or exploitation of current Bitcoin holders by the central authority because there is no central authority and the – algorithm and the software limits the expansion of bitcoins correct exactly right yes so everybody's running the same well everybody's running software that that adheres to this protocol that that's written down and you know everybody is validating everybody else's work so that if you try to break the rules and create more bitcoins than the algorithm says should be created then basically everybody else just ignores you and and you know they say your Bitcoins didn't follow the rules, therefore they're not valid and I'm not going to give you anything of value for them. Um, the, the, the limit put in place was, as far as we know, chosen pretty arbitrarily. And so there's a, there's a limit of 21 million Bitcoins that will ever be created. Right now we're at, if I recall correctly, I think somewhere between 12 and 13 million Bitcoins have been issued. Um, and we, you're, you call the, the that issuing is it's not it's not really the best word I guess it's the word we use with with regular banks but it's really a mining process right where people can go out and get them created up to that maximum of 21 million. Yes, yeah. I mean, you can think of it as kind of issued by this algorithm that that has a, a fixed schedule for how many bitcoins will be created over time, and that that schedule runs out like 100 years from now at, you know, the very last fraction of a Bitcoin is created. And actually, that's that's another important thing to point out is, is 
you know, when I say 21 million Bitcoins, you know, Bitcoins are very divisible. So, you know, we talk about fractions of a Bitcoin and you can trade in fractions of a Bitcoin. So the, the, you know, 21 million limit isn't a, a problem in practice. We don't run out because we just split them into finer and finer uh, pieces. Right. In theory, as the U.S. dollar continues to be inflated by the Central Reserve, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank, uh, Bitcoins would just become more valuable relative to dollars and their dollar amount would, would increase, correct? Yes. And that, that has happened over the last three years quite dramatically. So I looked at the, the the price on the exchanges when we last talked three years ago was about 70 cents. So for 70 cents, you could buy one Bitcoin. Uh, this morning when I checked, the price on the exchanges was about $450. So we're up about 500 times uh, what we were three years ago, in spite of there being uh, about twice as many Bitcoins in circulation today as there were three years ago. And how many people, how many vendors uh, accept Bitcoins now relative to the recent past? How much expansion has there been in the uh, opportunities to use Bitcoins? It, that's also really exploded. So there are at least tens of thousands of merchants all over the world accepting Bitcoin. And I, I know that because there are some companies that make it easier for Bitcoins to, excuse me, that make it easier for merchants to accept Bitcoins uh, for their products or services. And, you know, those companies occasionally release press releases boasting that, you know, 10,000th merchant has signed up uh, with their service to to accept Bitcoins. And that's that's a huge difference from three years ago where it was really hard to, you find things to spend your bitcoins on. It, it there were very few people uh, accepting bitcoins, and now, you know, the last few times I've gone anywhere, I've used a a, a website called Cheap Air that accepts bitcoins to pay for plane flights. Um, there's a the biggest merchant so far to accept bitcoin is probably Overstock.com, which sells you know, all sorts of things. You can buy just just about yeah, just about anything. Um, and, you know, they, they happily accept Bitcoin and, and did over a million dollars worth of Bitcoin transactions in the first, I think, 40 days that they were accepting them. So um, it, it really has exploded e even in just the past, uh, you know, three, four or five months. We've seen a huge increase. So let's talk about the trust issue. One element of trust that's relevant is the one we just talked about, which is fear of inflation being exploited uh, by an ex arbitrary expansion in the currency the other is just the the vagueness and un the new the novelty of the concept. So it's a weird thing, of course, in, in every bank. Um, I have a bank account at Schwab, Charles Schwab, and um, I assume they've got my money. I don't really worry at night that it's going to disappear. Part of that's because of the regulatory environment, but part of it's because of the brand name and um, a certain set of of implicit trust that's evolved because I assume they're not going to destroy their franchise. Where does – when I've got my Bitcoin wallet, how do I know it's not going to get emptied out by somebody? Where's the source of trust for those kind of of transactions? What's the what's the insurance either, you know, actual or implicit? The – well, I, I should first say I tell people not to trust Bitcoin too far. So I still say that it's an experiment and the whole thing could implode. I mean, when I said that three years ago, I think I was much less certain of Bitcoin's future for a lot of reasons um, than I am today. Uh, there is still a huge problem with keeping your Bitcoins safe. So, you know, my short answer to what is Bitcoin is it is cash for the internet. And it's very much like cash in that when you have some Bitcoins on your computer or on your cell phone, you really have them. I mean, they don't, they're not being held by, by somebody else. Um, and so if your computer or cell phone is stolen, if those Bitcoins, you know, come under somebody else's control, it's a lot like somebody stealing your physical wallet and that, you know, they now have your cash and they can spend it. And there's very little you can do to uh, prevent somebody from, from, from spending those Bitcoins. Um, so that's, that's a different model from most of the 
kind of electronic payment systems that we use today. If somebody steals your credit card and runs up some you know, invalid transactions on your credit card, you can dispute those charges with your credit card company and you can probably get that money back. You'll make your, the merchant will be very unhappy because you know, the, the, they're out whatever products or services they provided. Um, but you know, for consumers, it, credit cards are safer because you don't have to, to uh, you, you don't have to worry so much about you know what if it gets stolen. Um, we're actually doing a lot of technical work right now to help make it much easier to secure your bitcoins. So I think in the coming year or two, we'll probably start to see companies that will help you keep your bitcoins much safer, and yet do it in a way that you don't also have to trust the company. So, you know, one of the problems with trusting, you know, uh, Schwab or your credit card company is you, you have to trust them uh, with your money. And you know, sometimes that trust is misplaced. You know, we have seen banks fail, brokerages can fail, credit card companies can screw up and make your life miserable. So, it, you know, Bitcoin is a work in progress where you know, we're trying to figure out you know, how to get the best, best of both worlds, how to both give you control of your money, but also, you know, allow you enough control that your money is safe. Well, it's a good idea not to put all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, that's one of the lessons of economics. Uh, diversification under uncertainty and risk is always a good idea. Um, so there's obviously – inevitably some uncertainty. But what it reminds me of a little bit is when Amazon first started. And I remember it must have been sometime in the 1990s. I was having lunch with a, with someone who was a fairly intelligent person, I thought. And he told me that he gave his credit card to this weird internet company and they sent him, <laughs> they sent him books. And I said, uh, how does that work? He said, well, I just give him my credit card number. You just give it to, and, and he trusted them again in some dimension. It's not – It's not that word trust is a very rich concept, but he relied on their um, incentive to not abuse that trust. And now we do that constantly all the time. We understand there's some risk involved. The risk is mitigated by the way the credit card companies react and, and treat us, which is – has costs, of course. It may not be the best way to do it, but, but – these systems do emerge that try to make it easier, and I assume that is what will happen with Bitcoin if it if it does make it. Now, talk a little bit about the Bitcoin Foundation. Are you it? Uh, is there? You said you're paid by the foundation in Bitcoins. Who sets your salary? Who's who's in charge of the foundation? Nobody's in charge of Bitcoin. Uh, who's in charge of the foundation, and what role does the foundation play in the evolution of Bitcoin? Sure. Yeah, the Bitcoin Foundation is a, a nonprofit uh, trade association. Basically, it's a 501c6 here in the in the U.S. Uh, so it is a bunch of people who are interested in seeing Bitcoin succeed got together and created a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping Bitcoin succeed in 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 whatever way that. It, 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 in 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 however we think, uh, you know, it can succeed. So it is not just me. It is, uh, gee, I don't know how many employees the foundation has now. But, you know, as Bitcoin has had explosive growth, the foundation has had explosive growth also. So we're probably up to six or seven or eight employees at the Bitcoin foundation now. It's enormous. Um, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> no, it, it, it is still small, although uh, it's actually, the foundation is starting to go international. So... Um, you know, we have affiliates coming up um, all over the world and are recruiting more affiliates. So, you know, trying to, again, scale up as as this crazy project uh, scales up. Um, you asked who sets my salary? Yeah, who's, the in, who's in charge? Uh, the, who, who? Well, it's, it's like a traditional, you know, company. There's a board of directors. Um, I am on the Foundation Board of Directors, uh, although I think I will not run again, so I will not be a member of the Board of Directors um, by the end of this year. Uh, so the Board of Directors, you know, sets direction. There's an executive director who, you know, runs the the the, the corporation. 
and, uh, you know, helps set priorities along with the board. Um, and, you know, they set my salary. Uh, my salary is actually set in dollars. It's not set in Bitcoin. So there's a dollar amount that is converted to Bitcoins at the exchange rate at the beginning of every month. Um, and that, that has to be done because the, the Bitcoin price is not stable enough to, to write contracts in, uh, which is a, which is a, it's definitely a, a problem. Yeah, we'll talk uh, about that. Go ahead. So the role of the foundation really is to, to help Bitcoin succeed. So don't think of it as the foundation controls Bitcoin, um, but more, you know, the foundation does things to help Bitcoin be more successful. So things like paying me a salary to work on Bitcoin full time so that I can, you know, help make the software better and think about what are the technical challenges that will be coming up. Um, the last year, the Bitcoin Foundation has actually played a pretty big role in talking to regulators in Washington, D.C., because one of the issues with a, a completely decentralized system like Bitcoin is, is, you know, a lot of our legal and, you know, regulatory system aren't used to dealing with this, you know, things like Bitcoin or things like the Internet where there's, you know, no one clear entity in charge. Um, and so the foundation has played a, a, a really key role in talking to regulators, explaining what Bitcoin is, explaining how you can or can't control it, um, um, and you know, doing things like that to, to try to help make Bitcoin more successful. So that actually was going to be my next question, which is there's been an enormous increase in regulatory interest in Bitcoin uh, in the last few years, as it has become more uh, popular and available and active, um, you said they don't know what to do with you, but they're certainly going to try to find a way. I'm sure to 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 do something. So, two questions: What type of regulatory oversight is in place now, if any? Uh, and that's number one. Number two: Are you worried about that in the future? And number three: uh, Are you is there anything they can really do about it if, if in fact, people want to accept Bitcoins and, and use them freely? So here in the – first I should say it, it varies depends depending on where you are in the world. So if we're talking about regulation here in the United States, um, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, has kind of taken the, the lead on – I think they were one of the, the earliest regulators of Bitcoin. So they came out and said that if you are exchanging Bitcoins for dollars or you're helping people move Bitcoins around, then you fall under the existing money transmitter licensing requirements. And so there, there's a process for becoming a money transmitter and all sorts of regulations on, you know, you, you have to... Uh, abide by what are known as uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering regulations. So you're expected if transactions get above a certain threshold, you're expected to know, you know who's making those transactions, uh, what they're doing, where the money came from, and all of those those kinds of things. Essentially, this was all in reaction to you know terrorist financing and you know the drug war to try to make it harder for uh you know drug dealers to to uh you know spend their ill-gotten gains on uh on on products and services so that that's been the the fincen has has been the early regulator i mean for example recently the irs came out with a ruling on you know if you make profit on bitcoin how to, you know, how to report that profit on your taxes. Um, I actually was in Washington, D.C. recently talking to the Securities and Exchange Commission who had a lot of questions about you know, what is Bitcoin and will they have some role in regulating it? Um, so there, I think you're right. There is a, a lot of interest. Um, one thing that surprised me, though, is that I think here in the United States, uh, the regulators seem pretty reasonable. They They, they seem... Like they do understand that, you know, there's a lot of innovation possible here. And they, I think they really are trying to make an effort to balance what they see their job is, which is, you know, consumer protection and fighting money laundering versus, you know, allowing innovation to happen. So am I worried? Um, I think I'm less worried 
about the regulators than I am about uh, lawmakers. So, you know, I, we've seen, I think, some Congress people step forward and make some kind of crazy claims about Bitcoin. Uh, like what? The, well, that it is, you know, only good for illicit activity, for example. You know, there, there was a big um, online drug market called the Silk Road uh, that caused a, a furor among some Congress people uh, who were very upset about it. Um, which, I mean, the Silk Road is no longer business. They were they were um, put out of business, and the alleged founder of the Silk Road, the Dread Pirate Roberts, uh, was not related. Uh, I just want to say, not related to me. <laughs> For, I want to be transparent here. Although I think he was in the in the Bay Area. Uh, but I live in, I live in D.C. Actually, oh, you live in D.C. Yeah, I'm just out. Uh, I'm it. out at Stanford irregular, erratically. Uh, now I'm, I'm related to the Dread Private uh, Pirate Roberts in um, in the Princess Bride movie, but not the one who ran the Silk Road. <laughs> so I, I think my my fear would be that you know Congress people decide that we need a, a lot of new laws to to you know do something with Bitcoin to try to to try to ban it. And your final question was. If can they, they wanted can to, they? could they? Yeah, and that's that's a good question. I mean, there's there's a there's a fair bit of debate in the Bitcoin community. Uh, I think in the short term, they could definitely make it very hard uh, to transact in Bitcoin. One thing that we've seen is Bitcoin businesses have some Bitcoin businesses have had a lot of trouble keeping a bank account open because banks have want have for whatever reason, uh, I think fear of regulation, fear of the unknown, um, have shut down Bitcoin businesses' bank accounts, which can be difficult if you're a business that needs to, you know, trade Bitcoins for dollars in, in some, for, for whatever reason. Um, you know, I, I think long term, you could bootstrap beyond that, right? So for somebody like me who gets paid a salary in Bitcoin and then buys products and services with Bitcoin, with this decentralized network, there's not a clear kind of place for kind of regulators to get a handle on any of that activity. Um, although certainly, you know, when my before my salary gets to me, the taxes, payroll taxes are taken out and are converted into dollars and are sent to the government. So, you know, even there, unless you could imagine some huge kind of underground economy, which, I mean, the underground economy is huge. Yeah, I can imagine but, it. But, um, you know, I think most most businesses, you know, most large businesses anyway, you know, want to comply with the regulation. They don't want to pay their employees in cash under the table and they don't um, because they're afraid of, you know, being caught, their reputation being tarnished, them being thrown in jail. Um, so I, you know, that's kind of the debate in the, in the, in the Bitcoin world is, you know, could you get to a, a Bitcoin world where, you know, there, there's just, you know, we ignore the regulators and, and you know, I, I fall on the side of, you know, I don't think so, at least not at scale. Yeah, that's the issue. I think you could perhaps, but not at a scale that would make it interesting. Right, exactly. Um, what's, uh, let's talk briefly about that IRS ruling. Was that important for you? That bitcoins are property rather than currency for tax purposes. Um, it's uh, I think everybody. It's about the best uh, we could expect. Um, so it would have been nice if the IRS had ruled Bitcoin as currency because the the treatment of currency is a little better. If I you know spend a hundred dollars in Bitcoin, um, it's like spending a hundred dollars in euro on a European vacation, right? Uh, excuse me, it would be nice if it was treated like spending $100 in euro while I'm on vacation. For the IRS's purposes, if you spend $100 in euro, you don't need to go back and figure out how many dollars you paid for those euros and did you actually make a profit or a loss. Um, but they're saying with Bitcoin, for every little transaction that you do, it's treated like selling property. And so theoretically, you do need to go back and figure out, you know, I bought some things worth 
uh, $100, but I only paid $50 for those Bitcoins. So therefore, I owe $50 in capital gain taxes on that purchase. So it, it will be annoying. Um, you know, Bitcoin wallet software next year, I'm sure, will keep track of all of that for you and will make it easy for you to fill out your taxes properly. Um, but it also certainly also gets to the question of, well, would the IRS ever know? Um, yeah, that was my is, next question. Which is a separate question. And it, it'll probably be a lot like, you know, the internet and sales taxes, right? I live in Massachusetts where... I'm supposed to pay sales taxes on every single internet purchase I make, you know, no matter, you know. Careful, uh, Gavin. We have a lot of listeners. just want to say <laughs> that. Well, I, I will admit I have not done that in years past. Oh, I have okay. not kept track of every single internet purchase I made and paid the proper Massachusetts state sales taxes. And I would guess that, you know, any Massachusetts resident that has made more than three or four internet transactions would probably – you know, if they're honest, say the same. This may reduce your chances of becoming Attorney General of the United States. Just want to warn you. <laughs> although, although there's some evidence you're allowed to cheat on your taxes and still become, uh, say, Secretary of Treasury, hypothetically anyway. Um, <laughs> l let's move on. So you have this, the modest success. It, it, I, don't, I don't know how to characterize it. It's been quite dramatic success, but still modest overall. The modest success of, of, of Bitcoin over the last few years – has spawned some competitors. Um, is that good or bad for you? Do you? What do you What do you think of that of that environment that you're in now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I'm a big believer in competition. So, and and it, you know, Bitcoin is open source, so nothing stops somebody from taking it lock, stock, and barrel, and kind of redeploying the the core system and starting up their own currency. And hundreds of people have done that. So there are hundreds of what I call altcoins. Um, one of the surprising things to me, one of the things I've learned over the last three years is that there are people who will trade anything if it has a place to trade and has a price. So I think one of the, the you know, I don't have a, a kind of Wall Street trading mentality, uh, but I think a lot of these altcoins are, are really just people kind of taking a flyer, people who are excited about trading them to you know, try to buy low and sell high with no thought of, is there any underlying value or would, does this have any long-term potential? So I think a lot of, a lot of the altcoins that have been created are, are just about that. Um, there's also a really interesting phenomena of kind of a, a currency as uh, – I'm, as 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 a community, so as there's there's a, a interesting altcoin called Dogecoin, which I think is actually the the third largest uh, of these kind of Bitcoin wannabes, uh, which started out as a joke. So Doge Doge is this internet meme, which is this cute puppy that has kind of broken English two word, two and three word phrases. And the Doge beam has been around for a while. And some people decided to create Doge coin, uh, kind of as a, a lark, I understand. And it's a lark that in the nature of things on the internet, it just kind of went viral and took off and suddenly has, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of value. Um, and that's, a, that's, you know, something else which, just fascinates me to watch and look at and to see if, you know, will that currency have any lasting value? And if it does, you know, why, why do, why do people decide to, to invest in it? Yeah, that's, that's wild. Although I, I when I hear, I don't, I don't get to hear the word doge very often. So I do think of the court jester and Danny Kay, where he says the doge did what the doge does. Uh, <laughs> it is a great, great unappreciated movie for the – it's a great movie to watch with your children, The Court Jester. Uh, but uh, that's Dogecoin. You said they were the third largest. What's what's the second – what's the next largest competitor to Bitcoin? I believe uh, Bitcoin is largest and there's a, a coin called Litecoin, um, which I believe is second largest and then Dogecoin is third. Last I checked. How would you know? And how do you know uh, anything about any of these things? You know, we talked earlier about – how many bitcoins have been mined, and and how many are left to go, and how many merchants accept it? 
Uh, there's no government agency tracking this. Um, are these – are the, these numbers produced by the Bitcoin Foundation with respect to Bitcoin or somebody else gathering that somehow? How do we know? Well, I mean, for Bitcoin, we everybody knows how many Bitcoins there are because the Bitcoin system is a public ledger. So every transaction that has ever happened is announced over the internet, over this payment network. And actually... If you run the the reference implementation of Bitcoin, it actually spends a long time downloading the entire history of every Bitcoin transaction that has ever happened, including all of the all of what are called the Coinbase transactions, which create brand new Bitcoins. So you know you can run some software that will tell you exactly you know, how many Bitcoins there are, how many Bitcoin transactions there have been. Uh, to get at the price of Bitcoin, you have to look at Bitcoin exchanges, which you know publish the you know the exchange rate you know how many dollars does it cost to buy one bitcoin and given the number of bitcoins and the price you can calculate kind of a, a, a m1 money supply uh, of of value and the for litecoin and dogecoin similarly those are basically clones of bitcoin and so they also have a public ledger where anybody can connect to their networks and uh, download the history of their transactions and and see how many uh litecoins or dogecoins there are and Again, there are there are exchanges where you can exchange bitcoins for litecoins, bitcoins for dollars, litecoins for dollars. So, uh, you know, given given those markets, you can work out how much ac- economic activity is there, and you know how much is their value all their value overall. You call them clones because because I assume they use the same software, right? Yeah, I mean, typically. Uh, these 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 altcoins take the Bitcoin software and they tweak it a little bit. So, for example, Litecoin I think produces four times as many coins as Bitcoin, and uh, I don't. A Dogecoin produces like ten thousand times as many Dogecoins as as uh, Bitcoin, and, and those are tweaks they've made to the the, the kind of coin creation. Are there any aesthetics? Algorithm. Are there any aesthetics involved? One way you might compete. So you can have the prettiest money, right? Yep. And I, well, I, you know, I things could happen when you your wallet. You could look at your wallet in a certain way and see pictures of, you know, great uh, economists say in one of the on the bills or something. I don't know. Is there any role for aesthetics in in how this works? Well, I think that is part of Doge. I mean, they have that cute puppy as their logo, <laughs> <laughs> and that seems yeah. to be a large part of their value. And also, their their you know the way they market kind of their currency. They market it as this fun, easy thing. We're all going to, you know, tip each other, give lots of, we produce lots of money and we give away lots of money. And uh, yeah, they say that they sponsored the Jamaican bobsled team and they just have kind of this, this feeling of kind a vibe of and fun. It, yes, it's a vibe. Exactly. Around money, which is unusual. It is unusual. It's a, an odd place for people to kind of invest their kind of mental effort in my opinion, but, you know, I'm, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a hard-headed you know, geek <laughs> who kind of looks at nuts and bolts and doesn't think about things like, you know, does your money have a picture of a cute puppy on it? Paul Krugman has called Bitcoin evil. Uh, what's your reaction to that? I have trouble with people who call technologies evil. I mean, and maybe it's because I, I am a geek, uh, but, you know, I, I see technology as being value neutral, you know, what you do with the technology can be good or evil, but technology is what it is. I mean, it'd be, it'd be like calling the internet evil because people can say nasty things about you on it. And I'm sure Paul Krugman probably reading the comments on his blog has, has thought that maybe the internet is evil once in a while. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be working on Bitcoin if I didn't think that it will make the world a better place. I... I I just think that giving people control over their money and letting people innovate, you know, great things will happen. Well, I think he's worried. I'm not sure exactly what he's worried about. It seems to me it was a sort of um, the um, the enemy of my friend is my friend, or the friend of my. I, I'm lost in, the, in my really bad metaphor, but I, I think <laughs> I think it alarmed him that that the people who like Bitcoin tend to be people who also like the gold standard, people who like to see the government lose some control over the money supply and therefore uh, who see and hope 
that Bitcoin is some kind of alternative to the uh, central banking system, which would be glorious to me. I, I would be thrilled if it were actually an alternative to the central banking system of the world or the United States. Uh, is it an alternative? Is it a threat to the central banking system eventually, potentially? And uh, therefore, great for me and bad for Paul? Or is uh, that just kind of an overblown worry? Well, no, I think it could be. Uh, I think there's a I, – I think I said three or four years ago that there's a small chance that Bitcoin could replace the dollar as the world's reserve currency. And I still think that there's a small chance that Bitcoin could eventually replace the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Um, yeah, I say small chance because – I don't know anything so new and radically different. I think has a small chance of success. So there are all sorts of things that could happen that would would make it not be that successful. But theoretically, I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't replace you know the system we have now, where you have central banks trying to anticipate the future and be wise and figure out you know whether they can control the money supply uh, and, and if they can, uh, how they should control the money supply with a with a system that's completely deterministic and where the supply is completely predictable and fixed and, you know, the value just depends on the demand. Um, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to believe that that will be a better system that if you can kind of set one side of the equation fixed, that will work out and when I, you know, the equation I'm talking about is kind of supply and demand of money. So if you can set the supply, you know, fixed and predictable, then I think demand will take care of itself. I think people will be smart enough to figure out, you know, how to plan, um, you know, as best they can in kind of a wisdom of crowds way instead of a kind of centrally controlled central bank way. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I wish Milton Friedman were alive so we could get his opinion. I may have said this in our last interview. I don't remember, but... Certainly, uh, the design of Bitcoin is in the spirit of his – he wanted a slightly – a slowly increasing mechanical, mechanistic increase in the growth rate of money over time to take power and, and discretion away from central bankers. And I think in today's world, John Taylor at Stanford is probably the economist most associated with the idea of, of uh, a fixed rule rather than discretion, although his rule is – a little more complicated than Friedman's. Bitcoin's gone the opposite direction slightly. It is it is definitely a rule-based currency where it's a slight decrease, a slight, excuse me, it's a slight increase that the rate of which decreases over time. Right. So it's it's in the, certainly tremendously in the spirit of Friedman's idea that that, that would lead to a stable macroeconomic uh, system. And uh, I, I think you'd like it. Yeah, I... I hope so. It would be nice if he was still around. We could ask him. Um, and, and you know, my personal opinion, which, you know, I have no way of knowing if I'm right or not, but my personal opinion is that the rule doesn't really matter as long as everybody knows the rule, right? As long as it's it's open and everybody can predict what's going to happen on that side of the equation, then I think that will lead to eventually a a, you know, nice stable system. But it's not very stable right now. So one of the things you know you mentioned earlier is your salary is denominated in dollars but paid in bitcoins. Where that's a good idea because of the uh, wild, slightly large, sometimes wild swings in the value of bitcoins in terms of dollars because people are speculating. Do you expect that speculation to decrease over time and make it's that more more plausible as a as an actual currency rather than just a, a payment system? Uh, yes, uh, I hope so. And there, there's some evidence that that may already be happening. So Eli Dorado has been there's if you look at Eli Dorado Bitcoin volatility, he actually has been calculating volatility of Bitcoin over time, and it seems it does seem to be decreasing, which is what we would predict as you know more people get involved and we get more liquidity in the Bitcoin markets that, you know, you should see volatility decrease. You know, I would be happy if in five or 10 years, Bitcoin is as volatile as uh, gold, for example, which I mean, gold prices are, are still pretty volatile. But you know, if we can get there, then I think that will show that 
um, you know, Bitcoin volatility has does decrease as more people get involved, as you know, the kind of Bitcoin economy gets richer. Um, you know, things should even out. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. You know, it's a, it's um, not my area. Uh, in the case of gold, there's a natural supply, and there's some natural uses. Bitcoins, a lot of people have observed uh, in a denigrating way. I think Paul Krugman did this as well in his uh, the piece where he talked about it being evil. Is that well, there's nothing to anchor it. It doesn't have any. It's just sort of a, um, it's it's ethereal uh, because it doesn't have any practical use uh, other than than everyone believing that it does. So I guess in some sense, the speculative part might not settle down, but um, I don't know what the answer is to that. I don't know if anybody really knows. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure anybody knows either. And, you know, that, that is one of the reasons why I say Bitcoin is an experiment. Um, it's, you know, getting to be kind of a scarier and scarier experiment as as it gets larger and larger because if it fails, you know, there will be a lot of people who will lose the money they've invested if your Bitcoin prices go to zero. Um, you know what I call that, Gavin? What do you call that? Adulthood. <laughs> uh, that's called real life. It would be, you know, I don't, I don't wish it on anyone, um, but that's the way where the world is. It's uncertain and, and it should be that way. I don't want, I don't want a world where, oh, I don't have to worry about that at all because it's taken care of. That's called being a child. That's where you don't worry at night about food because you, your parents take care of making dinner for you. And so everything's hunky-dory. But um, yeah, so those of you out there with Bitcoins, caveat emptor, be careful. Buyer, seller, investor, beware. Uh, it's true we don't want to live in a world where there's we have to spend enormous amounts of time trying to figure out, you know, biting the coins we uh, receive to see if they're really gold or whatever would be the equivalent with Bitcoins. But um, yeah, it's that's the way the world works. It should work that way. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly true. And and uh, as long as the risks don't get hidden, I, I think that's okay. I think one of the, the the problems with our modern world is is I think there are some risks there that that are well hidden um, that we we don't see. Yeah, and that's why you don't eat mushrooms. You find out in the woods. Uh, unless <laughs> right. you know a lot about mushrooms. Uh, and it's true, tragically, there are people who don't know much about them. They look interesting. They put them in their mouth. Some are poisonous. Um, so it is a good idea to um, kick the tires a lot, bite the coins, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, let's turn to a slightly um, less um, thoughtful but perhaps more interesting question to our listeners, which is uh, – why do you think there's so much interest in Satoshi Nakamoto? And explain <laughs> for those out there who don't know, I'm tempted to say what he is or what it, what the name represents. So talk about Satoshi Nakamoto and what that's all about. Sure. So Satoshi Nakamoto is the creator of Bitcoin. So um, Satoshi is interesting because he is anonymous. Nobody knows who Satoshi is. I don't know who Satoshi is. I've only ever communicated with Satoshi electronically via email or, you know, like Bitcoin form posts. Um, and for all you know, it's like, you know, who wrote the Iliad? It wasn't Homer, but somebody else with the same name. You don't really be. know that the person who you think you're communicating with is the person who created Bitcoin, correct? That's true. I don't really know. Although, you know, given the communication and given the, the you know, demonstrated ability to write software code, um, you know, I'm pretty convinced that the person I was communicating with was the same person who wrote the Bitcoin white paper that kind of announced the Bitcoin system to the world and also wrote the initial implementation of Bitcoin that, you know, was the software we were all initially running to participate in the Bitcoin system. Um, and you know, why are people so interested in who this mystery person is? I guess it's you know people love a good mystery, um, and it is kind of fascinating that somebody could create this system, release it to the world, and yet remain anonymous, and yet remain you know nobody knows who he or she or they um, is or are. 
Well, it's the great and what is it? The great and powerful Oz, right? You want you want to look <laughs> you want to lift that curtain and see who's behind it. It's inevitable that you'd be curious. So, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, we had a, a Satoshi Nakamoto alert. Uh, somebody uh, was thought to be Satoshi Nakamoto, but it seems to be a false alert. We don't know, though, right? And it, it maybe really is him. I don't. But, right, we don't really know. But I think everybody in the Bitcoin community thinks that the person identified is not our Satoshi, is a, is a different Satoshi. The person uh, identified is actually named Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, Bad luck uh, for him, or maybe yeah, good luck, I don't know. Well, we'll see. I think, uh, I think things worked out okay. We actually, there was a, a, a spontaneous movement to take up donations in Bitcoin, of course, to, uh, you know, give them some Bitcoins for their trouble. And I think over thirty thousand dollars was was raised to give to Dorian, and that those bitcoins were actually uh, given to him. So uh, hopefully, hopefully the story has a happy ending. Yeah, what, what's fascinating about it to me is, you know, what there are a lot of reasons a person want, might want to be anonymous. Um, they don't want to have to answer all the questions that the press is going to ask. Uh, they don't want to be blamed if things go wrong. But of course, they don't get any of the glory when things go well. Although I guess you could reveal your identity at that point. Um, take off your Spider-Man mask and, you know, right? So <laughs> right. Right, Spider-Man stays anonymous because, you know, he's a, he's, it's a mixed blessing being Spider-Man. He's, he's full of angst and maybe Satoshi is also, we don't know. But so much of entrepreneurship is, is pride driven. And um, it's um, interesting that this person who's created something rather extraordinary is not getting any of the credit for it in, uh, in daily life. Uh, maybe from a spouse, maybe from, I don't know, we don't know how many people know, right, who, who if, if anyone knows who, yeah, you're who right, this we person don't. is. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, and yeah, I can't, I can, I, I guess I can kind of relate because, you know, when, when I started getting involved in, in Bitcoin, I never imagined that kind of I would get pushed forward as kind of Satoshi's heir and the kind of face and voice of Bitcoin. Um, but that's a role that I kind of accidentally ended up in, which I'm constantly trying to kind of step back from. Although, you know, when I do a podcast like this, it doesn't help. Um, <laughs> well, we don't, I said we have a lot of listeners, not, not that many. You're, you're okay. You're not going to be mobbed <laughs> on the street. Uh, uh, you're, you're probably going to be okay. Um, but yeah, I certainly can appreciate why Satoshi might have decided, you know, not to seek the limelight and tried to, you know, stay, to stay away. It, it's not, it's sometimes not fun to, to, uh, to have people pay lots of attention to you. Um, and, you know, depending on your personality, it, it can be painful. So, sure. you know, maybe Satoshi is just an introvert who really yeah. doesn't want the attention. In the movie version, he would pass on the secret to a chosen heir, maybe you, maybe someone else, uh, and that person would just assume the identity uh, without the world knowing that, that, <laughs> that there was a new Satoshi Nakamoto. It would just be like the emperor. It would just be a new one. Um, now, I'm going to shift gears now. We're going to move away from the Satoshi Nakamoto mystery. Not that we couldn't have spent the entire hour on it. I, I do find <laughs> it somewhat interesting. Um, I want to talk about a um, – Future guest on Econ Talk with a similar but not quite the same name as yours, Mark Andreessen of the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. He's been a big booster of Bitcoin, which I'm sure has led to some confusion uh, because of the similarity of your last name. Uh, but he's argued uh, very thoughtfully, in my opinion, that that Bitcoins it's not its currency ish currency ness that's important. But its ability to be an, an efficient electronic payment system that avoids uh, fraud that's inherent in current credit cards, uh, it's very low in transaction costs, fees, and other things that, that slow down trans small transactions, especially on the internet. And uh, why is that, if he's right, why is it that um, Bitcoin is so efficient relative to, say, a credit card? Well, Bitcoin was designed for the internet. So credit cards really weren't designed for the internet. They were designed, you know, back when you had those slidey machines that they used to use that made impressions on carbon paper and yep. then you did a physical signature. Um, and 
not being designed for the internet, there's a there there are actually pretty large hidden costs to using credit cards that we're all paying every day and we we don't realize it. So you merchants see these costs. Merchants know how much they're paying their credit card processing companies and they know if they're an internet merchant, uh, you know, what percentage of their sales get charged back, which is actually a lot of people don't know that you can dispute a credit card payment for I think it's up to 90 days and get your money back. And for merchants that are operating on the internet, chargebacks are a, a huge cost of business for them, both because they lose the money, but also because they're actually charged for every chargeback. So each chargeback costs them on the order of a few dollars um, in chargeback fees. So you know, Bitcoin is kind of designed from the ground up to be a creature of the internet and to work efficiently on the internet. So you know, Bitcoin, once a Bitcoin payment is broadcast and then confirmed, it's final. It's not going to get charged back. I mean, you actually... It, technically, there is. You could theoretically roll back a Bitcoin transaction once it's gotten confirmed by the network, but the cost of doing that is is specifically designed to be much higher than any you know possible profit you would get from doing that. So it just doesn't happen. Um, you know, the big Bitcoin payment processing companies that I, I I mentioned before that handle payment processing for merchants are seeing basically zero fraud and chargebacks for uh, Bitcoin transactions, which is is just a huge increase in, in efficiency and it lets them charge much lower prices, which makes merchants um, you know really happy and excited uh, for Bitcoin. And you know and is part of what's driving Mark Andreessen's enthusiasm for Bitcoin. I, I think the other Interesting thing that that Mark has written about, and which I'm hoping you'll you'll talk with him about, is this notion of permissionless innovation, and in that if you have a technology like the internet, where you don't need permission to participate, you will get a whole lot more innovation. So you know, back in the '90s, the internet started up; anybody could create an internet company, and lots of people did, and and lots of them failed. Um, you know, Bitcoin is doing the same thing for a payment network. You don't need permission to participate on the Bitcoin payment network. You just write some software and you start issuing transactions or looking at transactions and, and participating. Um, and so we're seeing lots and lots of uh, exciting innovation happening, a lot of which will fail miserably. And, uh, you know, again, buyer beware. Uh, but I think over time, you know, we'll find out, you know, what are the really great ideas and what are the really great companies and we'll see some really exciting things happen. So what kind of organizations are out there trying to facilitate that growth, doing that doing that permissionless innovation? A lot of venture capital firms I know are funding Bitcoin related firms. What are they doing? What's going on? Um well, for example, there's a a, a company called Coinbase that is a Bitcoin wallet company that makes it easy to connect your Bitcoin wallet to your bank account. And it's a great thing. You know, they're in, in and of themselves, they're, they're pretty innovative and they have some interesting stuff. But they actually recently ran a, a, a competition, which I was actually a judge for, where they have a, a programming interface where you can interact with their service. And so people can connect to Coinbase to to make things happen. And they had, uh, I forget if it was 20, 50, 100 different, it was on that order of number of people who had created little applications, little ideas of things that you could do using this uh, programming interface to their system. Um, and I think the the winning one was a, a dig for Bitcoin system where you could designate a place and put some virtual Bitcoins there. And then if you visited that place with a cell phone that knows where you are, you would get awarded some Bitcoins for kind of being there and quote unquote digging <laughs> for the Bitcoins, um, which is a wacky idea. I have no yep. idea if it will take off. Um, it's kind of like, you know, geocaching for Bitcoin, but it's all 
happening kind of in the virtual world overlaid on top of the physical world. So, you know, that's an example of it's innovative. You know, you can imagine a store doing this to get people to actually come and physically be inside their store. And then they'd, you know, instead of handing out cash, they, you know, get Bitcoins onto their cell phone. Um, then maybe it'll take off. Maybe it won't. It's certainly innovative. It's certainly interesting. It's certainly, you know, combining a whole bunch of different technologies together in a new and interesting way. So, I mean, that's just one example of the the kind of interesting ideas that people are experimenting with. Is anyone out there recruiting Amazon, trying to get Amazon to take Bitcoin? To take an uh, example, it could be you know any large internet uh, seller. Is, is there anybody out there who's marketing Bitcoin? Is that you? Uh, that is not me. And it's not really even the Bitcoin Foundation because – like I said, Bitcoin Foundation is mainly a, a trade organization. So representing the companies that are already involved in Bitcoin. And some of those companies may not want us to <laughs> try to recruit Amazon because sure. that would be a big competitor. Yep. Um, I would guess, I have no inside knowledge, but I would guess that some of the big Bitcoin processing companies like Coinbase or BitPay are lobbying Amazon and trying to, you know, get a meeting with Jeff Bezos to convince him that he'll save a whole bunch of money and get a whole bunch of new customers uh, for using Bitcoin. Um, at least, you know, if I were working at one of those companies, I would certainly want to try to help make that happen. I think recently uh, Jeff Bezos actually said that he doesn't see any reason to to embrace Bitcoin. You know, they're they're busy doing the things that they're doing and you get their drone fleet. Oh, exactly. Yeah, busy making delivery. That's a lot more important. Yeah, a whole lot faster. <laughs> um, and you know, he may be right. And, and you know, Bitcoin's still, in the grand scheme of things, pretty small. Um, but maybe in five years, it'll just be obvious. You know, I I I, I heard somebody make the analogy to, you know, imagine going to your local coffee shop, you know, five or 10 years ago and saying, you really need wireless internet access for your customers. Yeah. Um, in fact, it may have even been on Econ Talk. I'm not sure where I heard this. Um, and, you know, that would be a really hard sell to to a coffee shop owner. And yet now, you know, you need to have it to be competitive, competitive yeah. for people to go there. So, sure. um, yeah, I think Bitcoin could be the same way. If it continues to explode and grow the way it has been, you know, it'll just be obvious that, I mean, yes, you do need to accept it if you're an online merchant. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting about it, uh, as you know, as someone who's an outsider, is uh, how it got started and, and how it overcame the issues of trust. George Selchin's written some interesting uh, things about that, all, where he asked the question, who, because there's no natural use for it, who was the first person or people who accepted Bitcoins when there wasn't – it wasn't obvious that you'd be able to do anything with them. And eventually right. there becomes this sort of trust. And one of the things, at least in theory, uh, one of the things that strikes me about it is there are a lot of people out there who like who think it's just really cool and who'd like it to exist and who've invested in, as we talked about earlier, as a sort of community, both as a technological wonder and achievement, but also as a practical value, thing of practical value. And given that feeling, um, you know, people have an affection for it that's – you could call it irrational. I don't. I think it's uh, just hard to describe. It's different from other forms of affection that we're used to. And, and that affection will help it spread and will encourage merchants and others to use it who feel the same way. Yeah, and I think – I mean you think of any investment requires a leap of faith, right? Even if you're investing in, you know, something – physical, you know, you have to have faith that your coffee shop will be successful or that your internet interstate highway system will make your economy more productive. Um, and I mean, Bitcoin was an odd leap of faith because there was nothing physical. It's all very kind of mind stuff. But yeah, I think, I think that's very true that, you know, the, the Bitcoin community in scare quotes uh, did take that leap of faith and did start you know, trading Bitcoins and assigning value and have managed to bootstrap it, which is an amazing thing. What's the most surprising thing you've learned in the last three years? Maybe that, what we just said, but is there something else that comes to mind? Um, 
I think it's been surprising to me how tolerant of imperfection people are uh, if the incentives are aligned correctly. So we've had, Bitcoin has had a, a rough three years. I mean, there have been ups and downs and sideways and I mean, it's all sorts of things have happened. Um, some crashes, bubbles, bubbles have gone crashes. out of, exchanges have gone out we've, of business and we've wiped had out. technical issues yep. that could have possibly crashed the Bitcoin network. But, you know, everybody involved wants to see it succeed, right? I mean, if, if you're an early adopter in Bitcoin, you know, you want to see it succeed either for uh, philosophical reasons or pure, you know, profit motive. You know, I've invested time and money into this damn thing. I don't want it to fail. And so when you have that many people invested in its success, you know, solutions get found, you know, things recover. And so it's been surprisingly resilient to, you know, things that, Maybe three year, years ago, I'd have predicted if this happens, then you know, Bitcoin is dead. You know, if the you know, if a big Bitcoin exchange goes out of business, you know, we're done for. And you know that that happened. Uh, it certainly was not good for Bitcoin. Uh, but you know, Bitcoin kind of soldiers on because I think people are invested in trying to make it succeed. My guest today has been Gavin Andreessen. Gavin, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks a lot. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>